think in this particular case that management was putting roadblocks in the way or, or making things difficult? You know, I don't think he was putting them there, but he wasn't knocking them down, if that makes sense. He, he wasn't helping where he could help. I don't think he was doing anything on purpose to put them up, but he maybe he didn't know how to knock the roadblocks down. I don't know, but he allegedly was an experienced manager who had been around mm -hmm. for a long time. I think he was challenged on how do I, what do I do with this? Hello everyone, I'm Rishi Katz, and welcome to The Oval Table, where we discuss all things related to helping those who live and work within your business, how to survive, thrive, avoid pitfalls, have more fun, and become successful faster. Getting advice and input from someone outside of your business can make a big difference, and that's what we seek to do for you each and every week. Here at The Oval Table, we believe that every voice matters, and we want to model how that works, Often the advice that makes the difference comes from where you least expect it. We seek every week to provide a lens for a different way to do business. So much more is possible when everyone's ideas make it to the table. Let me introduce you to our co-hosts, Carl Walsh, Von Johnson, and Doug Bowers. What do you guys have for our listeners this week? Well, today we have with us somebody who's had an extensive career, both in the United States and abroad, Maria McHolland. But before we get to her, we're going to have a little discussion about inflation. I know something that is very heavy on everyone's mind today. We have at this oval table been discussing inflation and the possibilities of inflation since at least January, long before it was ever in the press as an, as an issue. And along the way here, we've had the Fed chairman saying, well, it's, it's not really an issue. It's really a, just a temporary disruption, and we're not really too worried about it. However, today he comes out and says, well, uh, I don't know. That may not be the case. We may need to think about raising rates if, if the inflation persists. The problem we have with inflation is that if it's strictly caused by so much money, so much government money in the system pushing up demand in a, in a situation which supply is, is uh, not there, then that creates temporary inflation. But if it becomes embedded in the system, then it's going to be outside of the governmental control and it's likely to go the rest, as we've discussed, go the rest of the decade. So this becomes a significant problem. There is two kinds of inflation. There is inflation within the economy as a whole, but there's also inflation in your industry. So one needs to be careful of, of what's going on, not just going by the government reports. Some of the government reports are almost designed to try and shift reality as opposed to, the, to what's really going on. If we look at how certain people have responded, let's look at the uh, shale drillers, for example. Um, they got significantly hurt when oil was, was very cheap. And then it got, got higher and they started, ship, they started producing again. Now that, that oil has fallen off to $70 or so, they, they've sort of decided to not produce or, or produce substantially less. You also have businesses that have been significantly hurt during the pandemic period. And if they can chance to raise their prices and have a chance to recover some of that hurt, um, that inflationary price increase is not likely to recede or it's not likely to recede back to where it was. So you have a number of things going on. You certainly have the pandemic problem, you have the government pumping money in, you have difference in supply chain problems, and then you also have businesses that have, have been hurt. And you probably have a fifth one, and that is businesses that have now disappeared. And the demand for those products pushed the product up. If you were a, a car dealer, for example, and you had a limited supply of cars, what would be the motivation to cut the price on those cars? Why would you not go at full price? Because you still have the rent, you still have the receptionist, you still have the power, you still have everything else going on, and you don't have the car revenue source, all you have is, is repair source. So there's not much motivation for you to cut price, so that holds the price up. And you have a limited supply anyway, which also drives up uh, used car prices, something like 45%. 
So you have a number of things going on which become very hard for the government to control. I can't simply say I'm going to reduce interest rates or I'm going to increase interest rates and therefore I'm going to control it that way. Economy can have a mind of its own. I read an article yesterday, gentlemen, that said that somewhere around 40% of the cause of the current inflation post-pandemic is the used car market. 40%. That, that rather uh, surprised me because it seems to me that everything is more expensive, particularly uh, when I go to the grocery store. Yeah, I, I think uh, nobody knows what the inflation rate is. Nobody has a clue because they don't include things like groceries. They don't include oil. They don't include housing. And anybody who has done business in any three of those areas knows that inflation is much higher than 5.4%. How long will it last? Well, who knows? We know the used car prices went up because car manufacturers couldn't produce new cars and are, and are still having a problem with that. So the demand for used cars went way, way up. The question is, when do, when do prices stop going up? They're not going to go down. Well, you know, oil fluctuates and, and fresh groceries fluctuate. But in the main, prices will not go, go down. We, we just don't do that. Uh, cars may go down when they stop selling cars, and they have to go down. Competition in the, in the marketplace uh, may do its work there, but that takes a long time. So the current observations that Inflation will continue through the end of the year, but hopefully stop then. Well, that's, that's good, but I don't think anyone knows. I really don't. I, I listened to a conversation on CNBC yesterday uh, amongst a whole lot of people that live by knowing how, how inflation works, and they all agreed. Who knows? was the major conclusion. And I've been seeing in recent months that uh, gold stocks have been rising after many years of what could almost be called a depression. Gold is going up again. And that's a main indicator that investors think inflation is having an effect and will continue to have an effect somewhat into the future. You know, in the food area, we have the additional problem is that they change packaging and they can increase the price. They can leave the price the same, but, but decrease the package. So you effectively have an increase. So it becomes hard to measure some of that stuff. Right. And, and I just love those half empty cereal boxes. If you're a closely held business, I think, and you're in the manufacturing sector, you need to get, you need to be really careful of watching what's happening on prices so that you don't get blindsided by a price increase that, that isn't going to go away. You shouldn't make the assumption it's going to go away. You should actually make sure that it either does go away or you adjust your prices accordingly. This is a topic I'm sure we're going to spend time on in, <laughs> in the near future and in the long term. We'd love to hear from you at home. Give us a visit at www.theovaltable.com and send us your thoughts. If you're enjoying this podcast, wait till you get your hands on Doug's book, we are Alpha Dogs, available on Amazon and wherever books, ebooks, and audiobooks are sold. Go to wearealphadogs.com for bonuses and downloads to help you and your company become legendary. And if you are especially adventurous, while you're at it, take the dog quiz and find out more about who you really are. Now, back to the Oval Table. Today we have with us Maria McHolland, who is a project manager professional, and she has worked with leading companies like GE and NCR, and has had many clients, not only around the country, but globally. Please help me welcome Maria McHolland. One of the fascinating things, Maria, of, of, about your experience was the time that you spent putting a team together and working with them from here, but they were in India. And this is a increasingly common situation. 
in business today, working remotely, team building remotely. I'm just wondering if you encountered any cultural hurdles. Well, thank you, Carl, for having me today. Yes, I ran into many cultural differences. That's one of the reasons why I thought about is sharing with you my experience in India. In building a team to do what I needed to do, I had to, as you mentioned, do this initially remotely to talk to people. And initially, it was even a challenge to get some people to open up and talk to me. They hadn't met me. I was a woman in a predominantly male organization. I had been coached on what I should say or not say to an Indian culture, to not get myself into trouble. One of the big hurdles was the fact that I was told, I know you need to talk to the people here, but they're probably not going to talk to you. And I said, well, okay, you need to give me a shot at that because they said they don't open up, especially to a woman, someone who they don't know. And I had to weed through what I thought would be valuable information for me to use when I physically got there versus who was just giving me lip service. Mm. The, The people there were told, oh, you have to talk to this woman. And that didn't start off very well either. I did some interviews on the phone to understand who I wanted to talk to and face-to-face once I got there. So the communication was probably the biggest hurdle. Physically getting there was another challenge for me. First time in a third world country traveling by myself, I landed at 1.30 a.m. in the morning and had strangers picking me up, had no idea where I was going to go had my escape route figured out. I don't know what I was going to do, just jump out of the car if I felt like I was in danger. And of course, it was pouring down rain. But I got to the hotel and was greeted with two warm chocolate chip cookies. So I figured that's not so bad. (laughs) I think the communication, being in a third world country for the first time, trying to understand my environment and trying to decide who I could trust. That was very challenging because they're taught to go along with who's perceived to be in a management position, but that doesn't mean they will be honest and truthful and open. So it was, it was a big challenge to understand what information I could use, especially when I talked to them in sunny California and, and thousands of miles away. And, and I, cause I had to give them a list of who I wanted to talk to when I physically got there. So it was, those are probably the biggest challenges that I can think of on this project. So how did you over overcome it or, or, or were you able to, to fully overcome per, per, particularly this, this gender bias that particular culture has? I feel like I did. I mean, you know, I had to use my charming self. I mean, what else (laughs) else did you do? Uh, When I got there, well, let me back up a moment. I had picked who I thought would be a mentor, who was the local manager. And I thought that from talking to him, okay, he's going to be straight with me. He's going to be on my side to help me. And that didn't necessarily turn out exactly that same way in the end. The biggest thing I did was just listen to these people. I started off by letting them know that I'm here as a program manager. I'm not a manager. I have no authority to fire you. I I have no authority to, to express who said what. This is all confidential conversations. So don't worry about what you say, how you say it. I'm here to find out what you have been experiencing because this was the project audit. I'm here to find out what you've been experiencing and to find ways to help you. I try my best to put them at ease, to let them know that I'm not a threat. 
that I'm not going to go tell their manager what they said and who they said what about whomever. So as a result, the interviews that I had scheduled for 30 minutes, some took over an hour. They kept talking to me to the point where their their manager, who I thought was going to be my mentor, he couldn't understand. Why are they talking to you? What are they saying? And I said, that's between me and them. I'm collecting data. I'm collecting experiences. And he, he said, most of these people I don't talk to for more than 10 minutes at a time. So why are they opening up to you? And I said, well, you better figure out why, because they work for you. They're your immediate team. So I think I just overcame it by listening, by being honest with them, being as sincere as I could be about why I was there and what I was going to do with that information. What was the nature of the engagement, Maria, exactly? What, what were you there to, to accomplish? This, there was a project with the Republic Bank of India. They were installing what we called our proof and encode machines for checks and to pay bills in the state of India. And the project wasn't going well. And the customer identified that. So the, so the customer is the one who said, I think you need a project audit. It was behind schedule, over budget, fraught with a lot of problems, and no one seemed to be addressing those problems. So I was there to do an independent audit to, co- to then come back with recommendations for improvement. And I had five days once I got there to collect data and then come back with some recommendations. So you really, you, you weren't there to implement anything. You weren't there to uh, do any change management or transformation. You were there to audit what a previous consulting firm or the company itself had attempted to implement and that didn't go well. That's right. They weren't done yet. So Mm. the customer was willing to stop the project in the middle of it to basically tell us as a vendor, get your act together or I'm going elsewhere. They were that upset because they knew things weren't going well and weren't getting better. And I think the local people were not acknowledging that. One of the things I found with the culture is that they don't want to admit that they're wrong. They don't want to look like they've done something wrong, even if there was no one to blame per se. But to some degree, I don't think they had the right leadership and the right planning. And in some cases, the right resources to get Mm. the job done. Mm. So that's why they wanted someone to come in and take a look at what had been happening and then say, okay, here's what you need to do. Well, not wanting to take blame for being wrong, that that may be a human condition, not just a cultural. (laughs) Yes, I think it was. They didn't want anything to have a bad reflection on what they had done. Mm -hmm. And that was an ongoing theme with all the interviews that I did is Mm. they did want to know, well, are you going to use my name? Well, no, your manager knows I'm talking to you, but nobody's going to know who said what. How much of the, the problem do you think was caused by the people that in their work versus the management and his leadership? Oh, I think it was probably about 75% management, 25% the people. I think the management, this was a huge project for them. It was very hard to get into the Republic Bank of India or RBI as they called themselves. It was a government contract, so it had been competitive to get in there anyway. And I think, as I learned in my career, you often overcommit when you respond to a request for proposal and what you can do. And it was highly customized. So I think the management didn't want to even admit to the customer, we have a problem, but we're going to fix it. The management kept acting like, well, you guys, you got to do it. You got to do it. But didn't really help them on how to do that. And I think the management, to some degree, left the employees kind of hanging. I think management should have provided the leadership and the tools and perhaps additional resources to help them. 
Because oftentimes, and I think this was the case here, the resources may not have the right skills to do the job. But the manager is often in a situation where he or she, in this case, he couldn't add resources. I don't remember why he couldn't. Probably because of the nature of the project and the fact that they were in Mumbai, India, and other people aren't just or weren't just readily available. So instead of of acknowledging that I need a different skill set and perhaps raising that through management, he probably would have gotten some help. But again, he didn't want to admit that my people can't do this. Ultimately, how did the project turn out? I'm happy to say that after I did my audit and came back with collecting all my data and did some uh, what we call a simple Pareto analysis, I came back with three things that they could do differently. And they implemented those three things and they were able to successfully finish the project. It was still late. It was still over budget. However, in a case like that, you can only really stop the bleeding and not worry as much about the financial side of it when you've got a customer that is upset and wants some change. But it, it, in, a, in the end, it worked out. And isn't that kind of typical that it took you five days to figure out what, what they needed to do while they had been twisting in the wind for how long? Oh, this had been going on for months. I didn't even know the product that well. And that's always been a topic of discussion for project managers, how you need to know the product. I didn't know much about the product line and process and, right and process and and yeah. using facts to get where you want in fact uh, when i published my report and i came back with okay it's the old 80 20 rule here's what's causing most of the problems and i included some exact statements from people and the gentleman who i thought was going to be my mentor wanted me to change the facts and I said, well, wait a minute. Well, no, this, is, this isn't correct. I said, well, it's not about being correct as it is listening to them and understanding where they're coming from and looking at some trends and come up with something. Because when you do those analysis, you always throw out the top one or two issues and the bottom one and get to the meat of it. But, and he was very upset. And I said, well, you're supposed to be helping me here, not challenging me. And when he finally agreed to publish the report, well, it, well, I guess he didn't really have a say in that. I published a report to our management because he and I worked with the same people ultimately. Then they came back and he, he agreed to do the things that I had suggested. But it was kind of interesting that he wanted me to change the facts. Again, they're going to think I'm a bad manager. And I said, what I didn't say, one or two was, well, they already think you're a bad manager at this point. <laughs> So don't worry about that. <laughs> it seems as though you uh, you identified the disconnect between what he thought reality was and what reality actually was. Yes, mm. exactly. And it wasn't as scary and bad, I don't think, for, for him and the team in the end. It's like, just take a look at what you're doing and what mm. do you need? Because the questions I asked them, I had 10 questions that I asked everybody, same questions. And it was interesting how some, I started seeing some things come up. And it, once you really listen and, and you understand what are you saying, you can do something with that. And it's not as scary as it might seem in the beginning. Real quickly, what are some of those questions that you ask? I asked them to describe their role on the project, what they understood their role to be, what they understood their objective to be, what were they there to do, what they feel like has been the most difficult part of the project for them what they liked about what they were doing for the project. I wanted to get both sides of, tell me something good. Don't just complain. Because I reinforced to them that this can't be all bad or you wouldn't have gotten this far. So tell me something that you really have enjoyed. So I could reinforce that in my recommendations if I saw a common theme. I got them to talk. I didn't ask yes or no questions to, to mm -hmm. get them to open up and gave me more leverage then to get more. Well, tell me more about that or why, tell me how you accomplished whatever they responded with. And they, they opened up. 
I'm surprised you got 10 questions because I did this once and I asked one question and an hour and a half later, I couldn't do anything else. Well, I didn't get to all the questions every time (laughs) because, because if you're listening, right, you hear, you'll hear the good stuff and then you'll play off of that and ask more based off of that, which I I don't think that's a bad thing, but I had a pool of 10 that I put picked from. Plus you're, you're giving them a chance to, showcase what what they've done well which I, gives them a certain trust and confidence in what you're doing that's right and every chance i had to compliment them on yeah. that or thank them for doing something i would sometimes get looks like why are you and they would say why are you thanking me because you did something right you did something good that's a good thing and you you could physically see sometimes their their body even sit up straighter when you Tell somebody they've done something good versus, oh, my gosh, I've got to go talk to this person I don't know. And what does she want? I think if you ask open ended questions, you'll find that people are not just terribly negative, but actually positive and negative. In the end, everybody wants to do well uh, if 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 they're given the chance to do so. And that's often the gap between management and employees and team members is that frustration when you feel like you're being tied down and you you know something's wrong, but you can't bring it out and brings up the whole issue of trusting uh, the people who are oh. on the front front lines that that they've got creative ideas. They can they can problem solve. Exactly. And they like to do that. I've just found in my whole management and project management career that you can't just point out what's not going well to people. You have to let them know what you liked and why you liked it, why it's a good thing, Mm -hmm. and give them a chance to feel more confident and shine. And when you do that, they do more times than not. You're going to have a few outliers that are just negative about everything. But if you put those aside, people just want to do good. They just want to do good. And I think you have to let them know and not be not assume that they they know that already. I think in this particular case that management was putting roadblocks in the way or, or making things difficult. You know, I don't think he was putting them there, but he wasn't knocking them down, if that makes sense. He he wasn't helping where he could help. I don't think he was doing anything on purpose to put them up, but he Maybe he didn't know how to knock the roadblocks down. I don't know. But he allegedly was an experienced manager who had been around Mm -hmm. for a long time. I think he was challenged on how do I, what do I do with this? Would it be fair to say that he wasn't championing his people? He was not. I don't believe he was. From what I heard in Saul, I don't think he was championing his people. He wasn't supporting them. I think he put them in a precarious situation without the right tools and in some cases the right skill set and basically said, go do this. You have to get the job done. Wow, what a great conversation. Alpha Dogs are always the first in line for the good stuff. So remember to download your favorite episodes at theovaltable.com. Stay up to date by subscribing and review us on Apple Podcasts to let other top dogs know how much you enjoy these conversations. Now, let's go back to the Oval Table to hear what impressed the guys from the interview. Welcome back. And we're sitting here talking about what a fabulous interview that was with Maria. My primary takeaway, guys, is that she ran into a number of unexpected cultural issues. Unexpected in the sense that I don't think she expected them. And also that um, the the reactions that she was getting may not have appeared to be cultural at first, may have just appeared to be um, part of the the process. What do you think, Carl? Well, I think that they were cultural issues and they certainly were. and, And that is the problem where a manager does not want their employees talking to someone outside of the group. And then once getting the feedback from the employees, not accepting it. And that may be a cultural problem, but isn't that a problem, a company cultural problem right here at home as as well? And this is the 
unintentional managerial paranoia that they can't ever be wrong. They can't ever, you know, what they say is it or they lose authority, which of course is not true, but it happens everywhere from dictatorial regimes to large corporations to small businesses to family. And it certainly happens in volunteer organizations. This is a, a problem of just fear, lack of confidence by the by the manager. I think what we have here is, is two uh, possibly different situations. One, we have a cultural influence where people didn't want to say anything wrong or say anything bad about the manager or the program or what they were doing. So that's, that's one set of influences. But an, another set of influences, especially in, in the U.S. economy, is where you have a my way or the highway type of manager who insists that mm. whatever they say is the correct way and, and everybody else is to just simply fall in line. These people typically have an open door policy and their open door means come in, tell me how wonderful I am, tell me how everything I'm doing right, but don't tell me anything wrong because I don't want to hear it. So there's two different situations here. I think Maria's situation was less of the dictatorial manager type and more of the cultural influence problem. I agree. I definitely buy that. But, but as I say, culture extends to organizations as well. And uh, though this per particular case was uh, India and their cultural differences, you can find the same stuff here. You know, it, 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 knows, no, it knows no boundaries, no borders. Well, as, as we all know, every business has a culture. And yes. we're, we're so sensitive to it that when we walk into a different business, we sense that culture right away. But every business mm -hmm. has a culture. The problem is that if you're trying to go somewhere, you're going to have to set up a culture that, that is oval table based, not my way the highway based. Absolutely. Oval table is a culture. It's, it's a very strong culture. Absolutely. I mean, we're open to new ideas, open to finding out mistakes, open to learning a, as a process along the way. And, and we don't necessarily think that if somebody has an idea that doesn't turn out well, it doesn't make them wrong. It just makes them more knowledgeable. But I'm not sure in her, her case that was what was going on. I think it was a lot more cultural dominance. Yeah, and, I, and I, I want to underscore that a bit. I think that um, the distinction you're trying to draw there, Doug, is culture within culture. In other words, a business culture that is ensconced in a in a uh, regional culture. Case in point, and we do have it, Carl. You're right. In this country, there is definitely a Hollywood culture. Okay, and then you take a business in Hollywood. So now you have a business in Hollywood. With, with its own culture ensconced within a Hollywood culture, right? But I don't think that's what Doug's talking about. I think what Doug is talking about is regional uh, cultures. Uh, the, the difference between, say, uh, Japan and the Netherlands or uh, Mexico and Canada. Uh, these, these regions have cultures which are separate and apart from what might be going on in a particular business. I mean, if you work for a jerk, you work for a jerk. And that can be anywhere on the on the planet. But I think what Doug is getting at is that there are regional differences that are uh, that, that can have an influence in general across a wide swath of businesses within that region. Oh, no doubt. And I found that working in Europe, that it's very different doing business there than, than doing business here. Absolutely. Well, even in the United States, we have... A southern culture, a northeastern culture, certainly a Maine culture, Vermont culture. Uh, we have a Midwest culture. And even in uh, the town we live in, there are a variety of cultures, even within this town. Doug, even within this state. we The three of us are in California. And you can't tell me that the regional culture of the Bay Area is like the regional culture of Southern California, particularly of Orange County. So, uh, yeah, these differences are obvious. So the, the, the fact that they're obvious is partly why it's a regional thing rather than, you know, a specific business thing. Well, that's what we think. We'd love to hear what you think. Go to www.theovaltable.com.
All right, y'all, it's time for my favorite part of the show, where we get to play Stump the Table. What's the question for this week? All right, for today's Stump the Table, we, we actually want to return to one that we got before from our friend in uh, North Carolina, H.H., because H.H. asked us a really fundamental and really important question that just covers maybe the most important questions you need to ask yourself as, as well. So what H.H. asked us was, I have no money and no time. How do I start a business? Doug, you have some ideas there? Yeah, go back to the fundamentals of a business. You need three things. You need time, money, and knowledge. You don't have to have all three, but you need to have three. And in fact, in the long run, you're not going to have all three. You're going to, to bring that in, other people in to provide that. So if you have perfect timing, as, as Mr. Gates found out, it cures a multitude of sins, but evidently not all sins. And you can't really go after timing quite as easily as you can the other two. So if you have knowledge about something, you want to start a business based on some topic or some, some skill set that you have, you're not going to have all the time it takes to develop that business. So you can hire time in as in the form of employees. So you can create time when you don't have it. You can, if, you, if the idea is central enough, if it's great enough, if it has enough potential, you can find the money to support that idea because angel investors and family and friends and other people will come forth to help you get started. And then once it proves itself, then you can find additional sums after that. So, in fact, if you look at the, the companies that have really gone somewhere, there's, there's no way you could have supplied that money. It's way, way too many millions to, to be able to do that. But you have to be able to do something. You have to have a central concept. If, if your concept is knowledge and you have an idea, you have a key idea to make a, a business go, in all likelihood, if it has real legs, it has real potential, you're not going to have all the knowledge it takes to make that business go. You're going to have to bring that other knowledge in. You're going to have to attract other people to your effort and endeavor. So you're going to have to do it anyway. No sense beating yourself up to start with. But if you have no money and no time and no knowledge, you have no idea what's going on, it's pretty hard to get started with zero. You have to have something. And usually it's knowledge about a, a particular area that gives you the uh, best shot at, at trying to be su become successful. I agree with that, Doug. The, uh, the knowledge is probably the most important of those three things. Because otherwise, why would you want to go into business about something you know nothing about? Although I've, I've known people who, who've done that and they've done it successfully. But I, I think most people who go into business for themselves have been working for others and think they could do it better. And, uh, and what they've learned or what they provide to the owner of the business that they work for has become more valuable than the time that they're spending working for that other person. And uh, if you don't have the time, if you don't have the time, you know, my question is, what are you thinking of? What are you thinking of? It's it's going to take a lots of time. It's going to consume your whole life, at least for some years to come. Well, it's an interesting subject you brought up, Vaughn, about becoming more valuable uh, working for someone else. If you are that someone else, then why are you not giving that person opportunity inside that business, in your business? Why are you not creating a space for them to, to run well in your business? Otherwise, you're just creating competitors for yourself. If you want to run a competitor school, that's a different business model than running a successful business. So one might think twice about that. Yeah, I, I mention it because even though you may have the knowledge to start your own business instead of working for somebody else, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know or that you have the passion to do it. Because to Carl's point, you're going to be spending a heck of a lot of time. And you're going to face things that can be very unpleasant. Hiring people, firing people, structural changes, finding the right building, negotiating a lease, uh, lease improvements, who pays for that, going to banks, writing business plans so the bank will give you some money, which is typically not enough, but enough to get you started. It's, it's a lot of things that are hard to do. Now, I would also point out that, that I think that passion alone is not sing, uh, enough to justify going into business because sooner or later... It's not the passion about what you do 
that is that is going to sustain you. It's the passion of the big dream and being able to make that big dream happen. I think that is far more important. I mean, I have a passion for riding bicycles, but that doesn't put me on the Tour de France. I think you need to have you have more than just passion. You need passion, but you need more than just passion to be become successful. Absolutely. Carl, do you want have anything to add? Yeah, just a, a little quick add on to what Doug was saying there is that you also need to find a way to send that little spark down into your customers as well, that they feel strongly about what you do and the services and products that you pro provide. And when, when you can nail that, well, you have a shot at having a business then. I certainly hope that uh, that all of this discussion is helping out HH with the, the critical decisions that person must make to start their own business. But we'd love to hear from you at home. So uh, go to www.theovaltable.com and uh, send us a note. We'd love to hear from you. No podcast like ours would be possible without the help of some talented people behind the scenes. We would like to thank Audavita Studios and their director of podcast production, Sean Hedinger. Recording engineer David Rosenblad, staging and show production David Wolf, social media Jay Spang, artist Marsha Carrington, and for our transcriber, Jamie Karras. We all hope you have a productive and inspirational week. I'm Rishi Katz, and we will see you next time here at the Oval Table.